<clears throat> Next up is um, one of my favorites. Uh, these are our augmentation. I'm just gonna say augmentation because if I say anything more than that, then the videos get taken down. So I will say um, these are our, this is for implants. The FDA has a uh, form that they want filled out. It is their form, it's their own thing. Um, just giving you information about the implants, which is, looks like this, am I a candidate for a successful, um, you know, this is their form that we will give you um, to sign at that time. So I understand I'm not a candidate if I have an infection anywhere in my body. Uh, yeah, if you have a tooth infection, if you have a UTI, if you have a skin infection, if you have anything, we do not want to do surgery if you have an infection anywhere in your body. Um, I am pregnant or nursing. I have an existing cancer, pre-cancer, my uh, tissue. I'm a smoker. I'm a former smoker. I have medical condition that affects my body to heal. So these kinds of things, um, this is going to give you just some additional things to think about that the FDA feels like you need to be able to make your decision about implants. So this is new. Well, I'd say new. It's probably about a year ago that they started doing this. We also have an informed consent for the procedure. So your consent forms, you are going to initial the bottom of every corner. That way you, um, that way we just, we know that you got all the pages. So you're gonna initial the bottom of every single corner and then you are going to sign the last page, which gives us permission to do this surgery. It goes through the risks of the treatment, uh, the indications, it goes through alternative treatments, uh, and it goes through some, some of the complications that you would want to look for, and it goes through, um, it even talks about, sorry, it talks about anesthesia, and um, it's telling you that your health insurance doesn't may not cover this, which it won't, for us it won't, that there are financial uh, responsibilities. It tells you that if you have complications, you could require additional surgery. So all of these things that we want you to look at and read through are here. You'll initial the bottom of every corner and you'll sign. So you will have a consent form and post-treatment instructions for the procedures that you're doing. So that is your consent form. You also have a consent form for anesthesia separately. This is kind of a duplicate because, I mean, you can read through this beforehand, but you'll have an anesthesia consent form in your packet on surgery day two. It looks different, but it's basically the same information and it's giving us consent to put you to sleep. So same as a consent for a surgery, this is a consent for the anesthesia, it tells you uh, things that things that can happen. Then you are going to have your post-op instructions, which will tell you um, just some overall basic things. So take your antibiotics as prescribed. We give you antibiotics in your IV while you are asleep. I should say that it's, it goes in your hand. We don't put it here, we put it in here. You get uh, antibiotics in your IV while you're asleep. So you actually don't need to start your antibiotic until the next day. So not that same day, people pick it up and they wanna take it the same day. You don't need it, start taking it the next day. Have somebody drive you home, help you for one to two days, get plenty of rest, follow a balanced diet, take your pain medication as prescribed. When you leave here, you will have we will have called in three prescriptions for you. Your antibiotic, you're going to have diazepam, which is Valium, uh, that helps with muscle spasms, and you're going to have um, your pain medicine. So when you leave surgery, they give you pain medicine um, when you're starting to wake up, and they give you anesthesia. Uh, 
nausea beds. So our patients are are seriously never, I shouldn't say never, I should not that would. Rarely, rarely ever are our patients nauseous. Our anesthesiologists really start treating that actually before you even wake up from surgery. So they start treating your nausea. Um, I get from patients, oh, well, I'm still nauseous, or they're calling me the next day, I can't stop throwing up. If you're nauseous that far out of your surgery, it's not from the anesthesia, it's from the pain medicine. The pain medicine does have acetaminophen in it. It has acetaminophen plus the uh, narcotic pain medicine in it, in it together. And the, the acetaminophen part of it just, just messes with your stomach. So when you're taking that on an empty stomach, it's, you get, it just, you're gonna throw up. You need to eat food. So once you leave here, you need to start with slow meals, like work up to it. Don't leave here and go to Whataburger because it's too much, you're gonna throw it up. You need to leave here, start with protein shakes, soup, crackers, get something in your stomach, make sure you can keep that down once you can eat something of some substance like um you know just slowly slowly increase don't go in with the greasy food because that's going to add fuel to the fire you're going to throw that up it's too heavy it's too it's just you're not going to want it so start eating when you leave here the biggest thing for you depending on where your incisions are is that you don't want to put um, stress. So a lot of times the incisions are underneath. If all you're doing is coming in for an augmentation, usually it's underneath. Well, when it's underneath, it's right here on the, um, the side where when you're using your arms and things like that, you're pulling and, and you're moving, you're causing you know, strain on that, um, on that incision. The incision is numb because I mean, it's numb. Your muscles are sore and tight, but the incision itself is numb. So you're not feeling if you are um, grabbing something and, and pulling and causing tension on that incision. So that's what you have to watch out for because if you are moving your arms around too much, you can cause that incision to open. And if you do, your implant can get infected. Not your, this is, I feel like I could talk about this a lot, but I'm trying to keep it normal. I don't want to scare you. Okay, so what you want to do is you, we're going to send you in a special um, support bra, and you are just going to go and relax. You're going to have steri strips, which are like flesh colored band aids. You're going to have steri strips on there. And then you'll have like a piece of gauze or something, or no, I'm sorry, you'll, you'll have the Curlex. You'll be wrapped in gauze and then you'll have the surgical bra. So the next day you can just undo that, take off all that gauze, leave on the surgical bra, switch to a sports bra. Um, if you've got one that zips up or pull up or whatever is comfortable for you, you're going to want some support because everything's gonna feel tight and it's going to, if you bump, if you move around, every little movement is gonna hurt. So you're gonna want to something that's a little, that's kind of tight. And then you could just take gauze, put the gauze, you know, against the incision and let the supporter bra hold it in place. You are gonna have what we call T-Rex arms for a couple weeks. Well, I don't wanna say a couple weeks, so I'm gonna say six weeks. Okay, six, six weeks. So T-Rex arms means <laughs> this, okay. So you can do whatever you want to if your arms are in this bubble. So if I'm working, if I'm sitting at my desk, if I'm doing things, um, you can, you are okay doing this. You cannot lift though. You can't push a shopping cart like this because <laughs> you can't have that weight. Um, nothing heavier than a gallon of milk, no shopping carts, no vacuums, nothing like that. No, this, that, reaching, nothing, slamming car doors, pushing, you know, grabbing your bag, slinging them, none of that because you're causing too much tension right here. And so I will tell you my story. Um, 
I am not one that likes to sit around after surgery. I'm one that actually likes to get up and do stuff. So I, um, I had my surgery, but it was, I had my implants replaced. So I didn't feel, I wasn't feeling anything. I was fine. Um, when you have an implant replacement, it, I mean, you've already stretched. It's not, I didn't find it painful at all. I could barely tell I had it done. So I decided that I was going to go outside and shovel some gravel into my tortoise pen. I didn't think anything about it. I felt fine. Well, I noticed that I was wearing a black sports bra and I noticed that I had like a little bit of like stuff on it, but it was black and I couldn't see it. And I was like, mm, I guess it's just, I guess I scratched the scab. Well, I didn't realize I had actually opened my incision. What it looks like is a little black hole, almost like a little pinhole in your incision. But the black that you're seeing inside that pinhole is the implant. In outside, it's reflecting all of this light. So it looks very, very light. But inside your body where it's dark, it's just gonna be black. So that's my implant, like right there, I can see it. So since it was open, since it was open, I mean, for who knows how long, how many days, back to, it's no longer sterile. This is sterile when we put it in. So it had a little opening, so it was exposed. And when that happens, the bacteria will attach to the shell of the implant. Your body then realizes, oh, I have a foreign invader and its job is to heal and get rid of the foreign invader. So it is going to just keep trying to get rid of it. The incision is going to open. Um, it's not going to heal until it gets, you know, until it gets rid of it. So he washed it all out, you know, tried washing it out, sewing it up, washing it out, sewing it up. Every two weeks it would open back up. And so finally I just had to take my implant out, um, let my body heal and then put it back in. It was like three months. Every once in a while, we have to do that with a patient that opens their incisions and their body won't, wants to reject the implant. The way to not do that is to not open your incision. So, you know, don't lift heavy stuff, don't get out there and overwork. Even though you feel fine, you're not fine, you're not healed. And so for the first two weeks, people are always fine. Like because you're sore, nobody's out there pulling stuff open the first two weeks. After two weeks, when everybody feels better, that's about the time that we start hearing from people that, you know, oh, my incision is draining or this, you know, things like that. What I learned from that experience is, number one, listen to the um the instructions because i went from a six week recovery to a six month recovery because i was nursing this incision constantly so and then finally after a few months i was like i can't do this anymore let's just take it out let's heal without an implant go back in for another surgery it was six months six months because i wanted i couldn't wait to go shovel some gravel so it's not worth it, I can tell you, it's not worth it. I get my surgeries free, that was a pain in the butt. Patients that have to pay, like you have to, you're gonna budget for two surgeries because you don't wanna listen, you know, and take it easy the first time, it's not worth it. And I hate to sound mean about that, and I just want you, I just want you to have a successful recovery. So I'm telling you, it is a big deal. You cannot lift a lot of stuff and do too much after your surgery. Um, so that's my big thing. Um, your, when people have, people don't understand either. Let me go back on, sorry. Let me go back on this for a minute. When we tell people your implants infected, it's not going to heal. They don't understand it because everything looks normal. Nothing is, there's no redness. There's no fever. You know, it look, they don't understand what an infected implant is. When your body doesn't recognize um, like silicone. It's fine with it's fine with the silicone, and this is sterile going in. So your body doesn't even do anything to it. It just heals, and you're good. But the moment there's bacteria on it, the bacteria attaches itself to the implant. It stays on on this shell, and then your body's rotating it. So all of a sudden, even though 
it caught here now we got it way up here and you know it's just bacteria on the surface of the implant that is an infected implant and your body will get rid of it it just means that there's bacteria on the shell it may not be visible to you or anything like that but unless this is sterile your body's not going to heal it so if we catch an opening fast enough sometimes we can um take you back and rinse it all out and try and do damage control and it'll be okay you know once we you know do hip cleanse and all that kind of stuff try and re-sterilize it re-sterilize the pocket um sometimes we can save it if you open your incision and sometimes your body will be okay and it'll heal it you know it's, it's fine we got rid of it but i wouldn't i wouldn't chance it i wouldn't chance it so that's that's the the biggest thing that we deal with as far as any type of complication after an augmentation is just somebody that opens their incisions and it's just it's it's completely avoidable it's really frustrating experience for the patient and it's completely avoidable so we'll preach to you about that a lot um no driving until you have full range of motion with your arms again you can drive just I wouldn't drive in rush hour where you're gonna be having to, you know, swerve or do anything really defensive. I would just try and, you know, make sure you keep your arms here. Um, the biggest thing is not the driving though, to be honest with you, it's the opening and closing the car door. People don't think about opening and closing that car door. Um, so you gotta be careful with that, especially if you drive something like a Jeep or a truck that you have to slam it, like, that's too hard. You need to find something easier. Um, <laughs> some way or do it easier you got to do something because you I've had a girl open to her incisions because she had a Jeep um, no raising your arms above your shoulder level you know for at least two weeks but then after that you have to be careful I get a lot of questions about hairdressers they will ask me how long I have to be off work you're okay cutting because I know you can put the person right here and you're okay it's the blow drying it's this like it's that pooling that if you have somebody else that can blow dry for you, then you'll be okay. If you can do everything right here, then you'll be fine. I get a lot of hairdressers, so that's a question I get a lot. So it says in here over and over again, no heavy lifting, no strenuous activity. Um, as far as showers and things, generally speaking, you will never soak a, a surgical incision. You'll never go in a pool or a bathtub until that thing is, is healed. No soaking, the water can dissolve a little bit of scab that you had and open it. It's not worth it. We're not, you know, no. Um, you can shower 24 hours after surgery. You will just face away from the water. Um, let it hit you from the back. Towel dry off. Um, your steri strips, you don't want to pack them away, you know, wet. Your steri strips stay on for two weeks. You don't want to pack them away wet. So what you'll want to do is just take a hair dryer on like low and low because you again you're numb if it's hot you're gonna burn yourself you're not gonna feel it so just on um on low until they're kind of dry they're paper it's like paper it's like paper tape is what it feels like so it dries really fast um put some gauze over it put the sports bra back on i wouldn't tape my gauze down because you're doing that for so long um your skin's gonna get irritated from the adhesive so I would just have your, your sports bra hold that gauze in. That was the other mistake that I made personally was that I was only wearing my sports bra and I didn't put gauze on there. Um, I also really love nursing pads, like for nursing moms, to so just slide one of those in there. I would wear one of those until my incisions are completely healed, um, scabs are gone, everything, because with the white pad, if you're looking at that every day, you are going to see how much drainage that is, what color it is, where it came, where, you know, where, what part it came from. Me, because I didn't have that pad and I wasn't looking at it, I, um, I don't know. I don't know how many days it was open. I don't know what color it was because my sports bra was black. I couldn't really see it. Um, I didn't know, I, I didn't know how long it was open. So if you have that pad, if you're looking at it, then you will know right away, like you'll be able to call us and say, hey, you know, this looks weird or I haven't been draining and now I am. Um, 
We recommend, we even have little mirrors that say check your incisions daily that we give you a lot of times in your bags. And that is so that you can check your incisions because I wasn't looking at mine. I had already done, this is like an implant exchange. I've already done this like twice, you know, I, it just, I wasn't thinking about having any kind of complication when I was a seasoned patient, but I did, you know, because I didn't follow the instructions. Um, when you're on your, so on your meds, the Valium, which is the diazepam, that is for muscle spasms, that's for the tightness that you feel um, after your surgery. When you're asleep and everything's relaxed, he puts the implants in, we see exactly what they're gonna look like, they look great. As soon as you wake up, your body realizes something was done to you, it reacts by tightening up and it pushes your implants up. So that first like 30 minutes when you wake up is really kind of the most intense, but you don't really remember it because we give you, I mean, we give you pain meds and then you have some versed, so you may not, you don't even really remember after your surgery, but that's really kind of the, the most, just because your body just wakes up and you're just tight. And then it, once you tighten up, it takes a long time for, uh, for everything to loosen back up. So, um, I forgot my train of thought. Oh, so the diazepam, so that's what that's for. We only give you a few of them, and that's because it's really the first few days that that tight, tightness is the most intense. So that's when you're gonna wanna take that. Um, you also have your pain medicine. You're gonna alternate the Valium and the pain medicine. Don't take them together, that's gonna, don't take them together. You're gonna alternate them um, as needed. And if you feel like you don't need it, then great. You can take Motrin. Um, if you know unless you're somebody that can't take Motrin you can take that with those meds you just can't take Tylenol because Tylenol is in your pain medicine so you'll end up overdosing yourself on Tylenol so no Tylenol after surgery if you are taking the pain meds we give you remember the pain meds make you nauseous you have to eat food with them not like a cracker like a meal to help it you know to help with the stomach issues that they cause the Valium won't really make you nauseous, so that's a good one, you know, kind of the first day when you're really, really tight and you need to take something and you don't have a lot of food in your stomach, that's really great to start off with the, with the Valium, which is why we give you that. Um, you want to sleep on your back, uh, but I would sleep slightly elevated, you know, like this kind of angle. Um, it helps with the swelling and it helps with your comfort. It's very difficult after surgery to go from like a completely like laid back to have to pull yourself up. And you can't pull yourself up because you can't use your arms. So, you know, you just, it's easier if you sleep a little bit elevated. I get headaches and so um, sleeping like that helped my headaches after surgery. Um, your steri strips are gonna stay on for two weeks. You may also have some skin glue on there if it looks kind of purple. That's uh, like Dermabond, it's, um, it's like skin glue, it's like skin super glue. So you just leave that on. If your steri strips start to come off, if they start to peel off, don't keep pushing that dirty wet steri strip back down. If it, part of it comes off, just cut it. Just cut the corner off. Um, and leave the part that's still stuck on for two weeks. At two weeks, you can peel it off. I would peel it off after your shower. People get so scared to take their stair strips off. Peel it after your shower and it will come right off. Um, let's see, no heating pads. You can use a heating pad on your back, but you can't use it anywhere near your, your incisions at all, nowhere. It's, if you're sleeping on your back, hurts your lower back, knock yourself out, but no heating pads on the front. Um, some things that are normal are just your, you know, your incisions to bleed a little bit. Um, sometimes you'll get a couple, like a couple months after surgery, all your sutures are absorbable. And so sometimes those will kind of poke through and they'll make what looks like a, like a pimple or like an ingrown hair, but it's not an ingrown hair, it's a little stitch. So if that happens, 
don't pop it because you're going to spread, you know, infection along your incision. If you have that little stitch abscess, which is, again, it's just a little stitch and it's got some pus on there, just put a band-aid on it. And those tiny little ones so you can't see it, you don't want to mess with it, just ignore it and it'll go away in a couple days. Um, if you pop it, you know, if it starts to get infected, then you got to call us. Okay. That is, oh, one more thing for the breast augmentation is when you come in for your pre-op, we're gonna let you try on the implant sizers. This is Mentor's implant sizing system. We primarily use Mentor implants. Um, this is their sizing system. So the best thing to do is to bring a sports bra with you, not an underwire, Victoria's Secret, push up, nothing like that. You want a sports bra. and. The reason is because, like this is, uh, sorry, it's kind of yellow, this is old. This is a 400 cc implant. And if I were to take and just put this in my shirt, I'm not, it's just, I'm not gonna see what that looks like. It's gonna look like a ball. So, but let me actually, this was the better one. This is Mentors. This is a 375, so essentially a 400. So, if I put this in my shirt though, it does kind of, when you put it in the body, it kind of does make this normal breast shape. See, like it was round, but this is not an anatomical implant. This is a round implant. Um, this is a moderate plus profile. And when you put it in, it kind of takes on an, a, a natural shape. So what the implant sizing system is, is this is, this is a 350. So this is a 375, this is 350. So pretty much the same size. This is letting you try on a 350cc prosthetic breast. So you're seeing what you look like with this on versus a gel ball. So th this is kind of cool. So we let you play around. We just leave you in the room with this sizing system. And it has um, all of these. So what? So you could start with like this 350 and you put both sides in. So you see them both. You put them in your sports bra. And then you can come up with these little baby ones. So this like 50 cc. And you can see like, oh, this is a 350. Well, now this is a 400. Now this is a 425. You can see that what difference these little increments make. And this sizing system actually goes all the way up to like 600. Oh, I'm sorry, 650. So it goes up to a, a 650 that you can try on in, in this. Well, 650 plus whatever you wanna add. So we really just put you in this room and let you try on just whatever whatever you think I get a lot of people that are like oh I can't make up my mind between a 400 and a 450 well I give them this 50 cc tiny little thing and I'm like well just put this on by itself do you notice the difference if you don't notice the difference when you don't have an implant you're not going to notice the difference when you do have one so 50 cc's is is not going to change your size of wardrobe. When you get into like, maybe like, this is like a 125, yeah, you'll see a difference. So don't lose sleep over a 50 cc, just make a decision. Whatever you're leaning towards, most people come back and wish they had gone a little bit bigger. So, you know, I would suggest if it's a, you know, between 350, 400, 400, 450, just, go with the bigger one but it's up to you it's whatever whichever way you are leaning so once you try this on then we tell Dr. Kratchmer okay this is the size that she liked when she tried on on your surgery day we will have a range of sizes so if you picked a 400 we're going to have probably everything from 350 to 500 um just in case you change your mind or you know something like that so we have we always have a range of sizes 
uh, because it also depends on how you measure. So the other thing that I will say is that people ask about different profiles. So the moderate plus is what I showed you earlier. It has a certain diameter. So when we, when you choose your size, oh, I want to be 400. The next thing that we're going to do, which you don't have to because we're the professionals, is we're going to say like, oh, okay, well, is she, you know, 17 centimeters? We're going to take that 400 and we're going to find the 17 centimeter implant that fits you. So we're going to, we're going to find the implant that fits what you want and the size of your body. That usually tells us whether you're going to be in a moderate plus, high profile, or something like that. Sometimes patients will come in and they'll say, hey, I want to be a high profile. That's good to know ahead of time too. So if this is a 375, this has a certain diameter, right? With our higher profile, so this is a high profile. What this is, this is a bigger implant though. But what it does is it's taking the same amount of gel and it's squishing it into a smaller diameter. So when you squish it into a smaller diameter, you get more projection. That makes your profile higher. So if this is a moderate plus. If I were trying to go down, if I were trying to get a 375 in a high profile, I'm gonna have to squeeze that thing into like a small, tiny little diameter. Most people are not that small. Who has a chest that size? So a 375 high profile is completely unrealistic because it would be like putting an orange in your shirt. To have a high enough CC, the higher, I'm trying to think because this is so confusing. I don't know how to explain this. The higher projection you want, because to get that projection, we have to squeeze it into a smaller circumference or a smaller diameter. You have, we, nobody is that small diameter wise. So in order to have that diameter, you know, we have to come out. And so we have to fill that with more CCs to get it to project inside this larger diameter. So that's why, yeah, this may, this 400 may be a great normal size if you want a moderate plus, but if you want this brand new, brand new, um, high profile, uh, one that Nintor just came out, which is an awesome implant, by the way, um, this is five, 35, 500 cc's because that's what, that's a normal diameter. If you see, these are kind of the same diameter. This size from here to here is what we need to fit you. So if you want a high profile, you're gonna be 500 something cc's. If you want a moderate plus, you're gonna be closer to 400. You see? So these are things, there's a lot of math things that go into selecting your implants for you. Dr. Kratchmer is really um, good at that. He's really good at, you know, taking into account what you want and trying to match it with what you tried on here versus what you say you want versus your size. And so when you come in for surgery that morning, you will again discuss with him, you know, this is, this is what I'm thinking and that that is your last kind of ditch opportunity to tell him ahead of time, this is what I want. Or sometimes people bring us pictures. I don't, I don't, I mean, you can, you know, but people just have different body shapes and stuff so that it's difficult. A uh, 400 cc on one person is not the same as a 400 cc on another person. So that's not really the best way. Um, but if you have, you know, bra size in mind, it's not an exact science, but he comes pretty close to kind of getting you uh, what you want. Okay, so that's it for my augmentation uh, pre-op information.